Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Wow, you light up my life. You're the ones that gave me hope when I didn't know there was any hope for me. Good evening to each and every one of you. My name is Liz. My anonymity's been shot to hell for a, <laughs> a long time. But I really don't run around telling who's in AA and who's not in AA. That's something I've never done, never will do. We respect each other like that. I want to take, I'm a grateful alcoholic a very grateful alcoholic, that I've lived in the time of Alcoholics Anonymous because all my family came from the South, North Carolina, and all around, and they all died from alcoholism because there was no knowledge of AA. So if you've got knowledge of AA, you've messed up your drinking and drugging anyway, so I'll tell you that <laughs> right away. You'll never drink and drink and drug again in peace. No, you can't. Now, the first thing, I haven't heard one of you come back in my 54 years and tell me it's so great out there. So, so I believe you, so I don't go back out. I want to thank Flo. I want her to stand up. I want you to give her the greatest round of applause. I'm not going to break the man's anonymity who helped me get here, but he knows that I thank him a million. Okay, baby? I just said I don't do that. You see what I mean? But I want to thank all the committee. It was said today, and I'm going to say it again. I want you all to think when they put on a conference, which I congratulate this conference, it's a whole, over a year's work put into it. And if you can ever get in on a committee, get in on a committee. It was freely given to you, so freely give it back. And what blessings you will receive by just sharing and caring in Alcoholics Anonymous. Last year in the May issue of the Grapevine, I, I had an interview on telephone, and they asked me what about the change in AA. There was two things that affected me. I never want to see an alcoholic sit in one of these rooms alone. Go over and talk to he or she. Say something to them. It's a we program. We can do together with that alcoholic and what I could never do alone. And the other one, I want to see that enthusiasm. Woo! Woo! Because when I came in, believe me, we worked with each other. We loved each other. We had enthusiasm. We sat out and we had three cars on the corner. You wanted to go to meet and get in the car. Where are you going? Get in the car. Where am I? Where are we going? You know? And we went to meetings. And when the drunk, see, the rehabs took our drunks away from us, really. Because, see, when I don't care what I was doing. I could be washing, ironing, cooking, cleaning, anything. I used to say even having sex, but I cut that out. <laughs> but when we got a call, when we got a call, we ran and grabbed another drunk, and we went to that drunk, picked up that drunk, cleaned up that drunk, now you all don't want a wet drunk to walk in the room. I think you got a hell of a nerve. You got a nerve. This is Alcoholics Anonymous. Where else is that drunk going? You got to have a lot of bucks to get in rehabs. And that's why so many rehabs have closed, too, because too much money. And they didn't see no much success. You go in there for socializing. Come into AA to do the slide. <laughs> Come in the AA to do the bump the bump. Yeah. Don't be out there. And love and care for each other. Speak nice about each other. Tonight I'm excited. I have so many of my beautiful friends that traveled hours to get here to be with me tonight. I'm selfish when I say that. But also with the conference. And I want to thank them. I cannot call their names. I'd be standing up here half the night calling their names. But you know who you are. And there's one girl here tonight. I've been talking to her. 
every living morning she would call me at 7.30. For 25 years or more, she's done that. I don't care where she went, she would be on that phone. And you know who I'm talking about? <laughs> she knows. And I do love Shirley. Because when I was sick, Shirley came. I didn't know why she was running away from home, though. <laughs> I thought she was just really babysitting me while I was sick. But she did sit there and read good spiritual food to me every night. And she would eat, and then in the morning she went to work, and then she went by her house for a little while to check it. But Shirley has been in my life for over the 20 years. One thing about AA, you get lasting friendships. Please don't ask me where anybody is that I drank with, because I would never be able to tell you. I never, And I don't look them up anyway, because they're not talking my language. And I don't deal with anybody who don't talk my language, because I'm talking to the wall. I live with a granddaughter, and I hope she hears this tape, too. <laughs> She'd look at me one day, and she says, Nanny, you weren't that bad. She's 34 years old. I'm 55 years sober. Now, what does she know about me? Her, her mother was five years old. She wasn't even thought about. But she'll look at me and tell me I wasn't that bad. She'll look back at me and tell me, you know, you had a choice. I said, Robbie, I had a choice now when I'm sober. But drunk, I had no choice. Had no choice when I picked up that drink. Never knew where I was winding up. Now, my mom made my first drink. Twelve years old. I was a stone alcoholic at twelve years old. I didn't know anything about alcoholism. Nobody talked that word. When I came to AA, I only know two things. What are we drinking and what are we chipping in for? <laughs> That's all I knew. Nobody ever told me I was an alcoholic or alcoholism. I never heard that. Didn't have time to hear it anyway. But here again, she'll look at me and she'll say, Where are you going, Nanny? I said, I'm going to a meeting. Oh, over 50 years and you're still making them meetings? Bye. <laughs> Out the door I go. I don't say nothing else. And by living with her, I've learned that silence is golden. <laughs> Shut your mouth and go do what you got to do. That goes for anybody who's having trouble. Because every time I went out, to, out of the house with living with Mr. Bailey, he called me Meshuggah and Cup. If you're Jewish, you know what that means. There goes the crazy one, you know. And he cursed me every time I should buy out the door. I have never let nobody stop me from AA. Don't plan to and will not. This is my life, not theirs. And I'm not accounted for anybody's life but mine. See? So my mom made my first drink at the age of 12. My mom made some rice wine. She received the ingredients from the welfare because I couldn't understand why this woman would make rice wine and my father's an alcoholic. And so she left myself and a little girl named Marion to sieve this rice wine through cheesecloth. Show you the difference. Everybody's not an alcoholic. And you can't call anybody an alcoholic but yourself. Don't run around calling people alcoholics. You don't know. Or addicts or drug addicts or whatever they are. Leave them alone. They know who they are. They keep coming around here long enough. You know? But so Marion sipped and sipped two drinks, and she went home. Not Liz. Liz sipped and sipped. Hmm. I sipped and sipped. Twelve years old, and I'm sipping and sipping. <laughs> I put on such a drunk, my mother lectured to me all night long. I had the nerve to go out in the street the next day, and I was shaking my little self, telling my friends, whoo, what a ball I had. I don't even remember what happened. <laughs> and that began to be the pattern of my life. If you didn't drink to pass out, you didn't say too much for me. And don't you ever take a drink like that and sip it 20 minutes in front of me. You got on my nerves. And I got away from you because you weren't drinking like I was drinking. So, you know, misery loves company. That I was strictly that. So I kept drinking. Now, the man next door made King Kong booze in the bathtub. And I was buying it by the gallon. 
And I was selling it for 40 cents a cream pitcher. Now, someone suggested that I take mayonnaise, olive oil, butter, cream, line yourself up, Liz. Boy, you can drink that King Kong, make good money. Well, that King Kong was so powerful, it went all through the maydays, the butter, the cream. I stopped taking that sick stuff, but I sold me some booze. I made good money. I put some little shoes. I'm the oldest of five. I put shoes on my brothers and sisters. And then one night, I'm laying out the window. I live one flight up in Washington Heights, Manhattan. And I see this cute dude. Oh, girls, he was so cute, I almost fell out the window. <laughs> Woo. And, and he was just tipping on down the street. And I said, and then he had a roll of money. I said, whoo, there's a live one. You know I was always looking for a live one. I don't look for dead eds in AA either, you know. I'll tell you that right now. I don't deal with no dead heads in AA. I deal with people that are coming and going and doing. See how they keep my motor running? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I went downstairs and latched on to this cute little dude. Found out it was a $5 bill around a lot of ones. <laughs> but he's so cute, who cares? So I started to go from uptown Manhattan all the way down to the Lower East Side, giving them all a play down there so they'd come up and give me a play. You know, we do that. So at the age of 14, you couldn't tell me I wasn't a woman. I'm partying, I'm hanging out. So I asked my mother. Now, I don't know I'm an alcoholic. I'm only 14 years old. And I asked her, would she sign for me to marry this man? He happens to be 10 years older than me. And she says, oh, no, dear. Other my dead body. <laughs> that man will have you out in the street, and you'll live a terrible <laughs> life with him. Well, I found out you don't tell no alcoholic what not to do, Al-Anon. <laughs> no. No. Because the very thing you tell them what not to do, they're going to do it if they die doing it. You see? So what did I do? I left New York with the same man. 17 years old, waited three years for him, 14 to 17. Went to Baltimore, Maryland, the third day of January, 1939. I'm standing up in the courthouse being married, and I'm crying my heart out. And the minister said to me, my dear young lady, would you mind telling me what you're crying about? I said, at last I got him. I'm going to be honest with every one of you in this room tonight. That was the sorriest day for Mr. Bailey. <laughs> oh, Mr. Bailey never stopped crying. From January 3rd, 1939, till he went home with the Lord, August the 12th, 1986. That was a sorry, sorry day. Now, I came back with the marriage license. Whoo, no more mama. Ha! Whoo, 17, I'm going to tear up New York. I'm ready, baby. You know how ready I was, too, don't you? Yeah, I'm going to tear it up. So now i got to have a drink to wash, to iron, to cook, to talk. Then I start taking the bottle out on the front stoop. You didn't do that up in that neighborhood. I could care less about the neighborhood when I'm drinking. <laughs> so, of course, I'm watching me go down. Now I find myself on my knees to Mr. Bailey continually. Please forgive me. I don't want to drink like this. I don't want to act like that. So I decided we should have children. So I got, took two years of marriage. I had my first baby. And the minute I didn't drink carrying the baby, but the minute that baby came and the baby said, Wah! I said, give me a drink. <laughs> give me a drink. Quick, quick, give me a drink. <laughs> Then what do I do? I have the second baby. Oh, ah! Give me a drink. <laughs> Third baby. Give me a drink. I, I didn't, couldn't stay sober. And I wanted to. I tried everything in my power to stay sober. I couldn't stay sober. And I'm watching me go down now. I'm beginning to hit hospitals. Girls, don't you ever fry a frozen chicken drunk. Don't do that. <laughs> Just don't do that. Now, I'm back in, the, back in my house, drinking with the neighbors, and she says to me as I'm drunk coming home, 
You know, Liz, you ate my husband's dinner. I said, well, I'll hand it to you over the fence. Well, I went in and pulled this frozen chicken out and tried to fry it and burn up both of my legs. And these legs stayed like raw meat as long as I drank. I came into AA. I used to show them when I was younger in AA, but I stopped that mess. So here, <laughs> but, so here my legs healed that you'd never believe I'd ever been burnt, right in these rooms. So, of course, I kept on drinking. And I said to Mr. Bailey one day, maybe if you drank with me, he was not an alcoholic, he was a workaholic. And I said, I wouldn't want to drink so much in Rome, because now when I pick up in the drink in the house, I can't stand the silent treatment, I can't stand the cockeyed looking at me, I don't want to hear your mouth, I've said many times when I'm on a drunk, shut up. And when I'm coming off a drunk, shut up. He couldn't win either way, you know that. (laughs) So I don't want to hear him. So he took me into the city. My sister had three bars in Manhattan. And he got drunk. And he came home and he fell in the radiator and bust his head open. (laughs) Well, of course, you know, he never took me back out again. But here again, I could have hit that radiator ten times. Wouldn't have made a difference, because it's going to be different the next time. <laughs> it's going to be different the next time, and I've hit it ten times already. You know what I mean? Sick! I don't know I'm so sick, but I'm sick. And I'm watching me go down. Go down. Many, many of the neighbors pull me up on the carpet. Many people, why do you drink the way you do? Why do you act the way you do? My God, you got a man that works every day for you. You got a beautiful home. I had every material thing any woman would want. Couldn't keep me sober, didn't get me sober. So you can deal with material things all you want, but don't rely on them to stay sober. I'll tell you that right now. So of course now, he I could rattle off excuses. Whoo! Mile a minute why I was staying so drunk. Do we come up with it quick, baby? And my main excuse was loneliness. I cried of loneliness all my life, looking for someone to love me, to understand me, to do something with me, and I could not find it in the streets of New York. I could not find it out there, even though I was looking, it was not out. Then I found myself wake up one day on Liberty Avenue Park bench. Woo! Something's wrong with this picture. What am I doing on this bench? Because now I'm drinking with the people on the corner, behind the barbershop. I'm drinking everywhere I could get a drink. And then one bar wouldn't let me in. (laughs) And then I'd go in a bar with no money. I'd borrow $2 from you to get me started. You know that. And then I'd pay you back that $2 because I'm going to hit you again. You know, I know this. (laughs) I know I'm going to hit you again. So I'd pay you back the $2. But I'm watching me go down. One morning I woke up with my head coming off my body. I took Alka-Seltzer, Anison, B.C. I put a raw egg in the beer. That's a meal, you know that. <laughs> put that raw egg. I'm going to have that meal. So I reached over on my night table, grabbed the Bible, figured maybe I'll find the answer in the Bible, how to straighten this rotten, filthy life up, because now I'm being beaten to a pulp where I can't come out the house two and three weeks at a time, because I got a bad mouth. I mean a bad mouth. See, drunk, you don't care. What do you care? I used to tell Mr. Bailey to each his own. I'm drinking this stuff you don't want for nothing. You know, that's what I'd always tell him. And so now he passes my room, and I got the Bible in my hand. Put that Bible down, you hypocrite. Put it down, he says. 20 minutes to an hour. You'll be so drunk, you'll be slapping one of the kids down, hopping a cab, or swinging a corner. How did he know about me? <laughs> I didn't even know he knew about me, you know? I didn't think he cared. So, of course, I run up and jump up in the second floor window. And just as I'm ready, ready to throw my body down in the yard, there's a lady named Nana Backa, and she spots me standing up in the window. Mr. Bailey! Mr. Bailey! You better get her! She's going to jump. And he comes out the window, and I see him. His hands come out. He says, Nana, will you let that bitch jump? (laughs) He says, you know, I'll be rid of all my problems, all my troubles. Please, please let her jump. 
Well, you know, I wanted to know who did he think he was. I got down out of that window, got back into that bed and pulled the sheet over me and slipped that one off. The nerve of him. The nerve of him. And I'm going down. I'm watching me go down. Broken fingers. Hear the Dr. Granager's pipe winding the finger up. Miss Bailey, please stop drinking. You're going to wake up one day where you're going to be sorry. It went in this air and out that air. I took every situation to Sutton's Bar and Grill on 177th and Jamaica Avenue. That's where you could find me sitting every time. I could drink all night on that finger. You know that. Then I put my hands through window plate glasses. I'm all sliced up. All the time you looked at me, I'm bandaged up somewhere because I'm crazy. I'm putting holes in the walls. I'm laying down with a cigarette and a can of beer. I don't care how drunk I got outside. That's what I had to have when I got inside. And the couch in me is all on fire. You know, and I'm telling you, total insanity. And I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And nobody and, and that I met mentioned. But Mr. Bailey came to me one night. He said, you know, Liz, you're the nicest wife when you're sober. Drunk, you're a Jekyll and a Hyde. Why don't you try this AA? <laughs> oh, I laid his soul to rest. You know just what I told him to do with AA. Every one of you know it. <laughs> oh, that poor man walked away from me, and I thank my God till today that he never mentioned AA again. Because if he had to beat me with AA, I'd have never made it, baby. My nature wouldn't let me make it. So we don't beat you in here. We attract you in here. Nobody promotes you in here. The door, you're free to come and go as you please. That's the most fantastic fellowship in the world where you can do that with your life. So again, he walked away and I kept on drinking. I tried to switch brands and I tried many things to stop drinking. Couldn't stop. So I drank another eight to ten months after he planted that seed with me. And I was in Brooklyn not too long ago, and I stand up speaking. I said, if you see what I got and you want what I got, and the guy winked at me. I said, man, I ain't talking about that stuff. <laughs> I, said, I said, look at that. Now, I got to rephrase that. <laughs> I tell you, it is something else. So I kept on drinking. My last drink, I'm drinking with hard two-fist drinkers in the VFW Hall on 110th and Merrick Road in, New, in Queens. And the guy called me, and I heard his voice, and I banged the phone down. He called me back the second time. I said, man, don't bug me. I'm looking for a lady to come to sell insurance for this house. I haven't seen this lady since I'm eight years old, and I really want to see her. I know me now. I know once I pick up the drink, I'm not going to throw the birthday parties I plan. I have planned many a birthday party. I got to have a drink to relax, one to get started. And the people sitting next to me is beating me all night at the bar. When are you going to, oh, after the next drink, after the next drink. So I never got to the party, but everybody would be at the party but me. See, and that used to fill me with guilt and remorse. You know why? Because here I've done it. Again. And I don't want to do it again. I don't want to. And so I'm going down. And so I went to the store and I came back. The guy called me back again. He said, do me a favor, Liz. Hop a cab. I'll introduce you to the people. I'll put you back in the cab and I'll send you home to your company. Let me do that because he's going to dry me up a wall today. He's not going to let me stay in here. So I get a cab. I go over to the post. The bows started lining up, and I'm singing, You always hurt the one you love. The one you don't want to hurt at all. Give me another drink. <laughs> well, if you're happy, give me another drink. Well, I'm 85, and I haven't seen a lady till yet. I don't forgot what the woman looked like. I woke up in one of my son's twin beds. The foot of this bed stood my mother and Mr. Bailey. My mom had her head just going, and she was screaming to the rooftop. 
Somebody done done something to her. Somebody done done something to her. And Mr. Bailey got his head going. And he's saying, no, Mom, no, Mom, nobody's done anything to her. She happens to be a very sick girl. Well, you know my name was Bitch. You know that. And I had never heard sick. Never heard sick. And so I got up out of that bed, and I went to the basement of that house. I stayed in the basement for two days praying to die. I want it out. I want it out. I couldn't take it anymore. And I remember my oldest son was 12 years old sitting there the second night in the basement. Richard, I can't live this way. I'm going to go up on the Long Island Railroad. I'm going to jump in front of a train, and I'm just going to end it. And that third step, which at that time I knew nothing about no third step, because I had never heard of AA, but only through Mr. Bailey, and that was it. But he could and would if he saw it. And I started screaming, oh, God, oh, God, never have I screamed, oh, God, so in my life. I used to bargain with God when I was drunk. If you get me off this one, don't let me get as much trouble. I didn't ask him to stop me from drinking, but just don't let me get in as much trouble the next time, you know. And here again, I, God answered me. I had looked and I said, oh, I got to try to say, hey, that your daddy told me about. Took the telephone book down, called AA. Now, when I came to AA, there were no women, very few women. There was a woman in California that fought for us women to be in AA. Thank God for her today, I'm telling you. And I love to see you women in AA today. Thank you for coming out of the closets. Thank you for coming out from under the rug. Thank you for coming out of the drawer. Wherever you've been hiding, thank you for coming out in the air and learn about yourself and get this good life. This life is so good, it scares you. It'll scare you. Can't believe that you ever could live a life like this. I can't believe it. It's awesome to me, even. It really is. It frightens me, too, at times. Just like the leader said. You get, get frightened. Because you can't believe this is me. I can't believe this is me. I must never forget my head laying in vomit. I didn't know who I was and where I was half the time. Come on. And God can pick you up and clean you up and let me stand tall with dignity today. Woo! 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 I'm telling you. Come on here, girls. Get on the ball. Because let me tell you, this guy could be drunk yesterday or whatever day and get up the next day and put on a tie. He's Mr. Smith. But me being nerdy and nerdy for three days or four days, I'm a bitch for a long time. You know what I mean? yeah. yeah, I know that. Women don't have it easy. You don't have it easy. So then what happened, I decided to go to AA. Now, I used to go to the beauty parlor and have my hair done so nice. And I'd get drunk and that booze would go to my hair. I had Afro way before Afro came in style. <laughs> Yes, I did. And I used to make my beautician very, very angry. And I'd curse her out because this is my head and my money. You know, that's how I talk to her. Mr. Bailey would give me money for clothes. I never looked too tough. I never could find what I wanted. I want to drink up the money. Come on. See, that's what I did. Now, Mr. Bailey was a furrier, girls. And every time I had a period of dryness before AA, he would make me a new fur coat. I had fur coats like beans, and I never liked them. So one year, he made me the most gorgeous leopard coat you ever laid your eyes on. Three linings, threw a party for the job, 305 7th Avenue, New York. And he brought that coat home, and he threw it out on the bed. And I looked at that leopard coat, and I hated it. I gave it away. I said he made it so he could spot me anywhere. <laughs> Got sober, got sober, and wanted my coat. <laughs> but you never know how sick you are if you stay in the throes of the booze. Yep. You have to get sober to see how sick you are or are. You don't see it otherwise. You gotta get sober first. See? 
So I gave that coat away. But then I remember so clearly after making that phone call, I went into Manhattan to intergroup. I tried to get up the first flight of stairs, and I got in the middle of the landing, and I said, oh, the hell with this AA. Let me get a drink. But here's where God stepped in. A lady looked down the stairs at me, and she says, are you having trouble? I said, yes, ma'am. And I ran up to her. I could run at that time, barely. And I ran up to her, and she escorted me in the front part of the office, and she sat me down, and she started to tell me about her life. <gasps> oh, my God, I got goose pimples, chills that started to fall off the chair. My mother taught me, you do not go out and tell nobody about yourself, about your black eyes, your busted mouths, or the fights that went on in your home. You keep that in the house. And here this woman is telling me about herself. And then she turns to me, you know, Liz, it's the first drink. I says, oh, come on, sweetie. I've been drinking for 19 years. She said, no, Liz, you pick up one drink. It is only a matter of time that this compulsion sets right up into you that you have to go all the way. Woo! I drank a pint on Monday, drank another pint Tuesday, drink a fifth on Wednesday, drink another fifth on Thursday, Friday, I'm knitting without needles. Said, I ain't knitting without needles. <laughs> I got to go get that drink to get me back in focus. And she said, we do it with meetings, meetings, meetings. We do it with a sponsor. Now, when I came to AA, AA was 17 years old. Monday, we made 72 years old. Don't any of you tell me you can't find a sponsor out of three and a half million members. There's got to be somebody good for you in these rooms. Search for it. And don't ever tell Liz that you fi fired my sponsor. You ain't hired nobody in the first damn place. <laughs> I fired my sponsor. I said, don't talk to me like that. I don't accept it. No. So again... I found myself a sponsor when I came in, a little, a little Irish lady. And I'm going to tell you, 55 years ago, they did not talk nice to you. They belted you because they meant business. They meant business. And I cried and whined to this woman. You know what she said to me? AA don't need you, but you need AA. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, I cried. And then I went back and whined some more. And she said, sit on that pot or get up off it. Well, she didn't say it that nice either. <laughs> See, I've had to work on myself. I'm still working on myself to keep my mouth clean, you know, because that devil is still in me. Because, see, I'm not cured. I'm not cured. I can't stand up here and tell you I'm a recovered alcoholic because I'm not. I am recovering every day, daily reprieves. I haven't got it made. I better be here whether you all like it or not. Because I was taught when anyone asks anything of you in Alcoholics Anonymous, you are not to say no. No, you're not. AA would have never grown if we did that. Would have never came to 72 years. So what did I do? She said, you go to your meetings. She gave me a choice of two meetings. One meeting, I said, oh, I can't go there. My children go there. So what? If the priest see you, he must know you need help. Go to that meeting. So I walk into my first AA meeting, and I'm only mimicking the girls. They're behind the coffee counter. And they look up at me, and I'm 31 years old, but 13 up here. So they look up at me, and they said, you don't look like an alcoholic. <laughs> I said, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> me get the hell out of here. <laughs> and I started running out the door, and they always kept two people at the door. Because once you got in, you did not get out. <laughs> it was none of this in and out that you guys do today. No, no, they sat on you. And they put two tables in the middle of the floor that night, and each one shared their strength, hope, and experience with me. And that was July the 11th, 1952. And I have not been any place since. 
And so I started 12 stepping right away. I used to have to bring the drunk into my home, he or she, because there was no rehabs, there was no halfway homes. Whatever you got today, please appreciate it. Because they're giving you a foundation. I had to work for my foundation. I mean work. I'm trying to raise my family. So I had 12, 10, and 5 of children. Since then, I've had an AA baby. I don't suggest that you get one. But, <laughs> but God gave me a beautiful one. April 3rd, she made 51 years old, my baby. And my oldest son, that 12-year-old one, 55 and 12 makes him 67. So that's my oldest. I lost two children in sobriety. I lost the son who got shot and killed. That's why I love this Bailey here and this guy here. What's your name? Whatever it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> because I used to tell my son, who was a handsome dude, Dennis, the right road may be hard, but you'll be the winner. The easy road, the price is heavy. And he stayed on the easy road, $100 shoes and, you know, all fine suits and hats. And he shot and killed him at 2 o'clock in the morning in between two houses in Brooklyn. I do not cry for Dennis. I do not believe in crying for the dead. You disturb their beautiful spirit. And I've never wanted to disturb my son's spirit. And now, my oldest son has hated my living guts for 55 and a half years. 54 and a half years. About five weeks ago, I got a phone call. I've spoken to this son five times in my sobriety. Three times nasty, so I don't dial for pain. I don't dial for nobody to talk nasty to me. I'm sorry. I'm not deserving of that today. <clears throat> but twice he spoke nice. But he called me five months now. I think it's going on five months. And I said, who am I speaking to? He said, your son. I said, which one? He said, how many sons have you got? I said, I got a many a son in AA. He said, no, but I'm your biological son. I'm calling to make amends to you. And I said, what? I said, I've always loved you. And he said, and I promise you now, I'm making a commitment that I'll call you every Sunday afternoon. I said, well, I can't accept that because I'm just about flying in on Sunday afternoon for my trip. But call me on Monday. Monday is Liz Bailey Day. When I finish with a weekend like this, baby, I need Monday for Liz. <laughs> I sleep and eat all day, and I stay in that recliner. And I was afraid to buy the damn recliner, too. I was afraid I'd get stuck in it. <laughs> but I'm not stuck in it. You guys keep me going. When I leave here, I'm going to Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, uh, Ohio. I'm on the move, honey. I haven't got time for the recliner. Not that much time. Thank God for that. But here again, my son is back in my life. He's bringing me to California the end of August to celebrate my birthday. August the 15th, I'll be 86. Wow. I'll swear to and, and I have 17 grandchildren, five great, but I see them by appointment only. I do not babysit. I'm sorry. This is Liz Bailey's life. I have put in my time with my family and all, and I'm going to live my life to the fullest. Anybody like her took me out to eat yesterday, she'd tell you, I ate a lot. <laughs> a lot. Only thing, I do cruises now, and I'm going on a cruise in November to eight uh, ports in, in the Caribbean, right? Uh huh. And I'm speaking on the crew with Nikki B from California. So I'm looking forward to that a day at a time. But I have never stopped going or giving. That's why in the giving I receive, in the giving I keep. Okay? I've gone up and had nine operations in 41 years. I've been to death's door. I've been cut to pieces, drunk and sober. I have taken every one of these scars and turned them into stars. I don't dwell about my scars. See, I'm really cut up, but it's okay. See, it's okay, because I know who I served. I know who I served. It's wonderful. I went up and had three operations in six weeks. The doctor said, you've got cancer. 
I'm going to give you six months to live. I said, you're not giving me nothing. <laughs> I'm in a fellowship. I'm in a fellowship that teaches me to live one day at a time. I'm now 40 years an arrested cancer patient. The doctor's dead. I'm not. <laughs> And look at me, I'm still hopping trains and planes and buses and stuff. And I've never had a car in my whole sobriety. And every night a different white dude picks me up, you know that. <laughs> and I upset my neighbors to know what. Oh my God, from a drunk to this, what is she putting down? But thank God I know what I'm putting down for many years. Because there was many years I didn't know what I was putting down. I did not know what I was putting down. But I've been privileged to know today. I have a little Aruba lady living next door to me. She look at me. Where you go? Me going with you. Me going with you. She said. She said when I retire, me gonna go with you. She, I said this lady don't know where I go or what I do. I'm gonna shock the hell out of her if she ever did. <laughs> and my neighbors keep up with me. Oh, she's gone again. You know all that stuff. And she, they can tell you what I have on even. You know, all like they watch me, which is good. It's very good. But again, I've had a fantastic life here. I use the steps. I've learned now. The first five years, I'm a five-year psycho person. The first five years was very hard on me. You know why? I wouldn't mention God. You talk to me about God, I'd lay your soul to rest. You know why? Because life wasn't treating me when I came in here the way I thought it should. With Mr. Bailey fighting me, and I had the honor and privilege of speaking for our late co-founder, Bill Wilson. I spoke for Bill's 28th anniversary, 2,700 people that night. I asked Mr. Bailey to sit on the dais with me. He told me, get yourself another husband for that night. So the girl that was there, when he said it, she said, you're going to ask him again? Hell no, I'm the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't ask him, but he showed up at 3 o'clock. And my sponsor had asked me not to show up too early for people to wear me out before I speak, you know. And what happened, all you guys lined up in the corner of the hotel Commodore, thanking him for me, blew the man's mind. He couldn't take that because he was so used to coming home from work every day, that bitch is drunk again, that bitch is gone again, you know. And then you're going to tell him how wonderful I am all of a sudden? He didn't want to hear that. So when I finished speaking for Bill, he banged every pot on the stove and he screamed, I've got to get rid of you and for this sobriety. And I used the third and the eleventh step at three in the morning because nobody makes decisions for nobody in these rooms. Nobody. Only your three and eleven. And God spoke to me just like I'm speaking to you. If I pick up one drink, I don't have me. If I pick up one drink, I don't have Mr. Bailey, and I didn't have him anyway. And when I pick up one drink, I'm not in that house. I'm waking up where I don't know where I'm at. My head laying in vomit, and I'm filthy and dirty. And I do not want to go back to that, because it's still out there. It's still out there. And I'm not cured, and daily reprieves I have. And I hang on to it. I got up this morning with this in my mind. This is the day that the Lord has made. Woo, let me be glad and rejoice in it instead of whining and complaining. See, because when you whine and complain, you keep yourself down. But when you rejoice, you come up. And greater is he that is in you. This room is powerful tonight, whether you know it or not, because he's in every one of us in this room. And all we have to do is tune it right in. Tune it right in. Ask, seek, find, receive. And he will answer you. And the God that I found in here, because after five years of cursing God, I found that this is a gift. And not everybody gets this gift. And if I want to keep this gift, I had better put one hand in God's, keep the other one in AA, and go on a journey. I'm on a journey, not a destination. Because I don't plan to stop till he stops me. 
and don't come up to me like some of them do. You left this out, you left that out. If he didn't give it to me, you take it up with him. Don't come to him. Because it's the language of the heart. I'm speaking from my heart. No junk and no garbage. I don't play games with nobody. Nobody. And I'm not a perfect person. I Sometimes I let people push my buttons, and I go off on you. I really go off on you. And they'll say, oh, not you, Liz. And I even have to say, oh, not you, Liz. Because <laughs> I have really worked to clean up my act. I really have. I really work it. And I mean hard. Because I don't want to be the old Liz. I didn't like the old Liz at all. I couldn't live with her. She was horrible. Horrible. And it's out there for me anytime I choose. So I hope I planted seeds because all of us are seed planters. And this is the last thing I'm going to say to you. There are six million alcoholics out there in that year. Six million of them. There's a job for every one of you to continue to work in AA because you're going to always have a drunk in your life if you're in Alcoholics yeah. Anonymous. Always. And I go in and out the prisons, and I go in and out the jails, I go in and out the hospitals. Wherever they send me, I go. And any state that you go into, they, if you say, I know Liz from New York, they know Liz from New York. See? Because I am not that cold type of a person. And my granddaughter, <laughs> the other day, she says to me, Hey, every time you hang up the phone, you're telling somebody you love them. How in the hell can you love all them people? <laughs> I cleaned it up, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, but I can love you. I got enough for all of you. Because I've lived here 55 years, the most gorgeous years of my life. And it's mind-blowing. Mind -blowing. I celebrate every year on Jones's Beach. This year I'll be celebrating July 15th. 12 to 1,500 of you come out to be with me every year. This is my 15th year on the beach. The rooms couldn't hold the people. This room couldn't hold the people. Couldn't hold the people. And I said, well, I'll stop celebrating. Because I didn't like them coming from Ohio and all upstate and different places and couldn't get in the room. That's not right. So the guy said, my wife and I started a meeting on Jones's Beach, Gate 2 West End. And you come and celebrate there. So that's where I've been celebrating for the past 15 years on Jones's Beach. And I, I don't want to celebrate it this year because it falls in the middle of the week. On July the 11th is a Wednesday. So I'm going to do it on the 15th. I want to stand in that circle and know I got that 55. <laughs> Get yourself a sponsee. Work with a sponsee. And remember that you're not God. Because sometimes I get mad at the sponsors, demanding people to do this and do that. Play God in your life. Don't do that. Don't do it. Keep it simple. Show them. Show them more than tell them. Show them more than tell them. See? Just like I was showing that guy with switching myself, you see? Yeah. I'm going to close with this. There was a minister preaching. He said, if you drink alcohol, you're doomed to die. And the little old lady down front, she said, hey, man. He said, now, if you smoke those cigarettes, you're doomed to die. And the little old lady said, hey, man. He said, now, if you chew tobacco, she said, look at that. He done stopped preaching and gone to meddling. <laughs> I love all of you. Thank all of you for being in my life today. My friend back there, Lou, uh, Lee, I call him Lee. He got Lewis on his tag, but I call him Lee all these years. I didn't expect him to be here today, and he showed up behind me and liked to flip me out. But he knows that I love him, and you guys know that I love you too. Keep coming. And go to the meeting you don't want to go to. That's the one you get the zinger every time. And truth hurts, but truth will set you free. Yes, it will. Believe this. No more lying, no more cheating, no more ducking, no more dodging. I worked like hell to stay sick. Yes, I did. And I don't have to do that.
All I got to do now is get on a plane and go where I'm going. Do what I got to do. And I don't take what I do for granted. I'm very humble to my God every day. I make him first in my life. I thank him. I praise him. I love him every day. Not one out of seven. Every day. And God knows. And my God has taught me the least that I do for one of his children. I'm doing it for him. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.